Welcome to the Pianist TV channel. In this following masterclass, Graham Fitch discusses octave technique. The filming takes place at Steinway Hall, right in the heart of London. Before Graham begins his lesson, here's a glance around Steinway's impressive showroom and Hall of Fame, as well as the all-important workshop. On this introduction, Graham plays the Gigue from Bach's French Suite No. 5 on a Model D Concert Grand, the same instrument on which he gives his lesson. Hello, I'm Graham Fitch. And here I am again at Steinway Hall in London, and this is my video demonstration on octaves that supplements the article in issue 71 of Pianist magazine. Now there's an awful lot to say about octaves, so I'll try and give you uh, the best of what I can offer in terms of practical help so that you'll be able to go away, practice these suggestions, and you should notice your octaves are improved. I'd like to start off just by making the difference, making a distinction between the different types of octaves that there are. We have so-called legato octaves. I'll give you a, a, a brief demonstration of this from Solveig's song uh, by Grieg. What I'm trying to do here is to create the impression that the top part of my right hand is playing a melody. Now, it can't be completely legato, even if I use a combination of fourth and fifth fingers. I'll show you what I mean. What I'm aiming to do there is to create the impression of a legato by my pedaling and by my timing and what I would like to call intonation, which is really the way I shape the top melody line. So in terms of how we achieve that, let me just play you first of all the top line with no thumb. And so on. What I'm trying to do there is to create the impression that I'm actually playing that with a regular fingering. Let me show you. Making it sound melodic. Now my thumb just traces very finely its notes. If I had too heavy a thumb, this is what would come out. Very heavy, very clumpy. So what I need to do when I practice this is very much to practice the top line by itself and the thumb line by itself. Let me change examples. I'm going to now show you from Schumann, Papillon, the the first piece, the first waltz. Now, when I practice that to prepare my hand for the sound that I want, I would first practice the top line. quite firmly, but certainly with melodic shape. When I practice my thumb line by itself, I'm aiming to do it just a touch faster than the tempo to encourage lightness. Because if we look at our hand, the top finger, which is responsible for the melody line, is actually our smallest finger and our weakest finger. And our thumb, which we want just to be a shadow underneath, is our heaviest. So we need to encourage lightness. So I play my thumb that little bit softer and that little bit faster for practicing. I'm going to get into practice methods in a little bit, but let me first of all uh, continue with my categorization and talk about wrist octaves. Now, here's a, a, an example from Czerny. This is a study by Czerny, and I'll play you a little bit of it. In order to create the, the sound that I want here, I have to have a slightly higher wrist and I'm operating my wrist in this manner with a very light hand. And so on. 
Now, in order to achieve that effect, I keep my wrist higher and I flutter from my wrist. There are plenty of examples of this in the repertoire too. And what might start off as legato octaves in my papillon example might turn into wrist octaves as I go up the scale. It really, the, the, these touches are very much blends when we're in the final analysis. Now, let me just talk a little bit about how we can not get stiff and tight when we're doing these repeated octaves. Let me just show you now what I'm going to do with my arm when I play my wrist octaves. My arm is very mobile. I'm aiming to take in several of these wrist strokes in one arm movement. So the arm might go in very subtly. Now that keeps me very loose, very relaxed. I could go on for a good long time and not get in the least bit tired because my wrist and my arm are working together. Now, moving on to other types of octaves, the big virtuoso octaves that we find in Liszt and Brahms and Rachmaninoff. Now, these require a very strong hand. Let me give you a little example of this from, this is a, a snippet from the Liszt Sonata. And it goes on. I'll show you in a little bit how I'm um, approaching that. What I need is a firm hand and a wrist that is not broken, in other words, not a floppy wrist. And what I want to do when I play is to feel that I'm bouncing from one octave to the next. I'll show you what that looks like. This is how I would suggest practicing such an octave. From the key surface, lift a little bit, and then bounce. Now notice that that bounce takes me to the next octave. My hand is firm, my wrist is firm, but not stiff, and my arm bounces me from position to position. I'd like to talk a little bit about how we prepare the hand for octave playing when our hand is big enough to manage it. Now, there's nothing more, more uh, damaging to fine piano playing than tension. So let me talk a little bit about the fingering options that we have. Traditionally, the fourth finger has been used on black keys and the fifth finger on white keys. I'll give you a little example of that. Now, this enables me to play a legato. The danger, if your hand is too small or if using the fourth finger brings the hand into this position, this is a big no-no in all piano playing. We do not want pigeon-toed, or should I say pigeon-fingered, um, positions. So if using the fourth finger does not move my hand out of position, out of a natural position, then it's fine to use the fourth. If there's any question or if there's any tightness, use all fifth fingers. It's absolutely fine to use all fifth fingers. A preliminary exercise that I would suggest, which is in my article, is where we hold on to an octave and at the same time as I'm holding on to this octave, I'm making sure that my wrist is very supple. So what I'm doing here, I'm using down-up movements, very easy and loose movements of my wrist to make sure that I'm physically free here. Very, very important. The next exercise that I suggest, and you can make your own up. It doesn't have to be exactly like this. I'll show you in the left hand so that you can see what my thumb's doing. I'm hanging on to my fifth finger, and I'm making my thumb move chromatically. And I can go on like that. Now, what, what I'm feeling there is mobility in the tip of my thumb. And I'm feeling that my fifth finger is holding on firmly, but not in any way tensely, to its finger, to its key. Another thing I would like to add about practicing octaves, which I will talk about when I do my double note demonstration, and that is to bounce the thumb. Let me go back to that list example. Now, I would practice it, first of all, just the fifth finger by itself. 
as I showed you before. But when I put it together, I get great uh, uh, comfort and skill from rebounding my thumb. Just a little word about how I'm doing that. I'm feeling that that rebound, do you see where that's coming from? It's coming from my forearm. It's what's known as forearm rotation. It's very small movement in the end. It's a tiny little movement, but if we practice... Slightly exaggerating that, I'm feeling a great sense of freedom in my arm. Finally, we can do the same thing with the outer finger. I use all fifth fingers here. I would generally suggest using all fifth fingers when we're doing forearm or whole arm octaves. That's um, a by the by, but I would strongly suggest it. Now, when I do my repetition of the fifth finger, do you notice that I'm still using my rotary movements, but I'm adding to it a tenuto quality to the finger to build in a little bit more firmness into that part of my hand. Just one final word about octave playing. I think it's very important not only to avoid these positions of the hand, but also to avoid a position where the wrist is low, which causes us tension, and it, it's basically a very unskillful position to adopt. So final advice, light thumb, firmer in the fifth finger, use these movements, use these movements, and use these movements, but generally make sure that your wrist does not drop below that sort of a level. I hope that's given you a few ideas on octave playing, and I look forward to joining you again soon.